And so this morning I had to, was up early, moving around the house, and uh, if you haven't been around, you haven't noticed, or you haven't heard, the, our sermon series for the actual overarching theme of uh, worship over the year is for us to amplify the Word of God in our life. And I explained that that came through uh, me trying to be quiet in the morning as I get up before Vicki and move around the house and, and get ready, and that everything, when it's super quiet, every little thing you do sounds loud. Everything sounds like it's magnified. It doesn't matter if you drop a paper clip, it just sounds really loud when you're trying to be quiet. And I was reminded of that again this morning as uh, everything I try to do. Now, I'm a master at being quiet. I've had a lot of years of practice, but sometimes the harder you try to be quiet, the louder things become. So I'm getting my coffee cup this morning and I'm being so, I open the cabinet completely silent. And then you hear, clang. I thought I was being so careful, just pulling that coffee mug out so gentle, and the handle hit another mug. And to me, it sounded like the loudest thing ever. And Vicki said, I, I never heard it. And you know what? It hit me. I wonder if I'm like that sometimes, where God is speaking loudly to me. He's calling me. He, he's trying to woo me back to himself. And no matter how loud it is, I'm not hearing it. I'm not listening. I'm not ready. So I want us, as we wrestle with the, the towards the end of the book of Joel, to, to be mindful. To We need to take time to be quiet. And we talked about this on Ash Wednesday, where uh, we're not necessarily looking to do something. But maybe this time between Ash Wednesday and Easter that we call Lent is a time for us maybe to try to tone things down a little bit and hear the Lord that is speaking to us, that is calling us, that, that is wooing us back to himself and, and calling us back to a place of strength, comfort, rejuvenation, restoration, healing. Because sometimes when he's speaking, we're just not hearing it. So we're going to cover some difficult stuff towards uh, the end of Joel. We, we've covered some difficult stuff uh, prior. We're going to cover some difficult stuff today. And uh, I, I do want to make one correction, though. Last week, we ended on verse 10, where the scripture says, Beat your plowshares into swords, which is exactly opposite of Isaiah 2, 4, which reads this. He shall judge between the nations. He shall decide disputes for many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. And then God says in verse, leading up to verse 10, while we're supposed to be gathering for this war, verse 10 says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Now, initially it looked like that was God's people. That was God calling his people to this time of vindication. And we remember that God said that he was going to bring uh, up the nations to this time of judgment for what they've done to his people. But as I was studying for this week's sermon, I had to go back to what we had studied last week to make sure everything connects. And, and it was revealed that you have to go all the way back to verse 9. Where God says, proclaim this among the nations, consecrate for war, stir up the mighty men, let the men of war draw near, let them come up. He's speaking about coming to the valley of judgment, the valley of Jehoshaphat. And when by the time we get to verse 10, he is not speaking to his followers. He's continuing to spread the word out across the world to those who are opposed to him, telling, look, you can gather all the tools you want of war, and you're invited to come against me. He even said, let the weak, meaning the weakest person who opposes him, feel like a warrior. That's where we enter verse 11. The title of the sermon today is The Sovereign Judge. We know that no matter what, God is sovereign over all. 
We see injustice. We see all kinds of things that make us angry. We see a number of injustices that, that rise up this righteous indignation. But we can be confident at one day, Joel is speaking not about in a, in a recent future for Israel, but Joel is speaking far into the future, beyond what we even see. He's speaking of the very end, of the final judgment, when God would call the nations together, those who have hated him, those who have chosen not to receive his grace, his mercy, his love, those who have not chosen to follow God in justice, but those who have opposed him and have destroyed his people, persecuted his people, put his people down. The sovereign judge will get to a point when he says enough is enough. Verse 11, Joel 3, verse 11. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. So, God is speaking, and then the end of that verse, Isaiah inserts, bring down your warriors. Bring down, where are God's warriors? They're in the heavens. He's speaking of an angelic realm. Verse 12 picks up with the Lord again. Let the nations stir them up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We remember that Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. So God is gathering the nations at a time way in the distant. And they have heaped up sin upon themselves by their continuing acts of wickedness perpetrated against human beings and specifically God's own children. He says, and for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Make no mistake, our Lord is the sovereign judge. There is no greater court above his. We have steps of court. Our ultimate earthly court here in America is the Supreme Court, but I want to let you know that there is a Supreme Court that is much higher than our earthly Supreme Court, who judges righteously, who is perfect and holy, who is all-powerful and sees everything. Everything we think we're hiding, we're not. We might be hiding it from ourselves and from other people, but the Sovereign Lord sees it all. But then we get to verse 13. And things begin to get uncomfortable again. God says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in and tread the winepress, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow for their great evil. So he's calling upon his angelic army to, to come up with the sickle and mow down wickedness. And it's uncomfortable to think of God speaking that way. And we think, how could a God of love do that? If God says he's loving, why doesn't it seem like he's acting like that? This seems harsh. But then we read, For the winepress is full, the vats overflow with their wickedness. For their evil is great. A loving Lord could never stand by for eternity and allow injustice to be carried out on innocent people. One of the most unloving things God could do is to stand by and do nothing, which is often what he's accused of. When he doesn't do things on our timeline, when he doesn't bring justice and mercy when we think he should, and that he's working in the background, and one day... We will be vindicated by his hand. Verse 14 says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Wait, I thought we were in the valley of Jehoshaphat. We are. Now it has been called the valley of decision. Or otherwise interpreted the valley of verdict. We know in courtrooms today, 
there is a verdict. We go before a jury, facts are laid out, and then a verdict is given. But now we are talking a global scale. When the Lord, the sovereign judge, calls the guilty. And last week we were reminded that he is judge, jury, and the prosecutor. And as he sits over his global courtroom and judges the nations for their wickedness, he says, you're in the valley of verdict. Justice is about to be meted out. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge for his people. A stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy and strangers shall never again pass through it. And we know that this is a time for the future because since this writing, people have trampled through Jerusalem. We know the horrible things that happened to God's people in recent memory. We know this is the time in the future that God has promised to vindicate all injustice from Cain's murdering of Abel to the very last act of violence when God says enough. So you might be wondering that's great but what does that have to do with us today? Why would we care about what Joel is saying so many years ago. Does it really apply to our lives today? Does this ancient text talking about a distant future really have connection for us today? Or is this just a wonderful history lesson? In fact, every time we gather, we should be asking, what does this mean for us today? How do we apply this to our lives? Now, number one, I want to point out again that oftentimes we are appalled at what we read in the Old Testament scriptures. Sometimes we are offended at God's actions. And sometimes you might hear the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. And I want to tell you that when you hear that, you know that whoever is speaking that is speaking heresy. We serve one Lord, manifest in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's one Lord. The Lord and God of the Old Testament is the same Lord and God of the New Testament. And you can find God act in harsh ways, what we would deem harsh, in the New Testament. How many of you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the, the birth of the church. They lied and their lives were taken immediately. God gave them an opportunity to repent from their lie and when they, they doubled down, as we would say, on the lie, God removed them. When his wife came in, Peter asked. She told the story and lied. After her second chance, she was taken. Let me read for you from the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 15 and 16, and then verse 18 and 19. 
And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. This might sound familiar. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he sat on the cloud, swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Verse 18 and 19, another angel came out from the altar. The angel who had authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put your sickle in and gather the clusters from the wine of the earth, for the, its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest from the earth and threw it into the great, great winepress of the wrath of God. And verse 20. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle. What this means for us today, God does not fool around with sin. God will not allow wickedness to prevail forever. And one of the beautiful things that we're learning as we study the Psalms on a daily basis is that God is open to our pleadings, our anger, and our bitterness when we cry out and say, why haven't you operated? Why haven't you done this? Psalm 73 the psalm writer is mad at God because God's people are being persecuted and the evil seem like they're prevailing. But what we need to remember is when we feel like saying, Lord, you are not just, you are not loving, we need to go back to the Old Testament and see all the acts of grace and mercy God has shed on his people. Take Noah, for example. If God truly was not a God of love, he would not have had Noah spend 120 years building the ark. Why did it take so long? God gave the world an opportunity to receive grace and forgiveness, and they chose not to. Jesus came in flesh and blood, and it said, his own received him not. The Old Testament is full of the patience and grace and mercy of God. God is not some vindictive, angry deity sitting in heaven waiting to jump at the chance when he can punish his people. He is a sovereign, all-knowing, loving Lord. And that love demands justice, especially when perpetrated against his people. Think of it. If you had a family member who was being abused, would you say, because I love you, I'm not going to turn you into the police. I'm going to allow you to continue to abuse my family members. Because you've been made in the image of God, you shouldn't have to stand trial. You shouldn't have to stand uh, justice. You shouldn't have to be brought up on charges. I'm just going to allow you to continue to harm and abuse my family member. That would be unloving. Because of God's great love for his people, one day there will be a judgment for those who have committed great wickedness. And by the time we get to the book of Revelation, we have a complete history. From the time Adam and Eve were removed from the garden and God made a covering for them, and we have thousands of years of history where God has continually poured out his grace, his love, his mercy, and his call to humanity saying, I love you. Come and be saved. Come and be protected. But instead, we see in Joel and in Revelation the overflow of wickedness that God at some point has to put an end to. Sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, I get tunnel vision, and I think only one way. And sometimes it takes a jolt 
for me to understand something in a new way. What this means for us today is that we serve one Lord. He is loving, protective, and gracious in the Old Testament. He is loving, protective, and gracious in the New Testament. Think about it. The children of Israel were rescued from slavery. And when they left, what did they begin to do? They began to murmur and complain and be angry. And they even said, Oh, if we could just go back to Egypt. God rescued them. He answered their prayers. He send, sent Moses to bring them out of slavery. And then they begged to go back. But God said, no. I will bring you through the desert even if you don't love me. He refused to fail on his part of the covenant. He made a covenant with his people. And when Jesus came and we celebrate communion, we celebrate the new covenant by Jesus' blood and given body. You don't get a greater illustration of radical, unconditional love than that. And while they kicked and screamed through the desert, God had an opportunity at the Red Sea to say, fine, go back to Egypt and let them be destroyed. Instead, because of his great love and his mercy, he parted the Red Sea, allowed them to pass on dry ground, and then wiped out their enemy. Why did he wipe out their enemy? Because of his love for them. And we've seen that God says, they're as the apple of my eye. We can know for a fact that God is just as loving just as gracious and just as merciful in the Old Testament as he is in the New. Never forget, we serve one Lord. He reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He loves unconditionally. He has grace, and who are we to think that we are more gracious than God? And who are we to think that we are, have greater understanding or that we are more loving than God? What it means for us today is that what we believed in is true. I want you to leave here today, even though this is a somber text, rejoicing a possibly a new understanding of the incredible love your Heavenly Father has for each and every one of you. He is your protector. He is your guide. He is your comforter. He came as one of us. He gave himself for you and for me that we might be rescued from eternal separation from him. Because he is a perfect, pure, holy, loving Lord. And seeks that all would come to repentance and forgiveness. That is a picture of the love of Christ for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes it would be really easy <clears throat> to preach something less difficult. It would be easy for us to engage only the quote-unquote good parts of the Bible 
and set aside some of the things that are difficult for us to read, to discuss, to understand. But Lord, we want to have a full picture and a full knowledge of who you are as best we can here. We truly want to understand what you're saying to us through your word and what were you saying then. Thank you that your ancient scriptures can still apply to our lives today and that they are still relevant. Thank you for being our vindicator. Thank you for being our protector. And Lord, thank you that you saw how messed up we are and you came anyway. And you prepaid for the sin that we would commit long after you rose from the grave. Help us with an open mind led by the Holy Spirit. Read and understand your word. We ask all this, Father the wonderful name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen.